My name is, is Hunter Cheney, and I'm, I'm part of the, the Collings Foundation. The, the Collings Foundation is a, a 501c3 educational nonprofit foundation. We were founded in 1979 by Bob and Caroline Collings. The, the Collings family has continued to uh, be directors of the foundation. Since we were started, since we were founded, the, the goal of the Collings Foundation, the, the purpose of the Collings Foundation is to enable particularly Americans to learn more about history, to learn more about world history, to learn more about our heritage through direct participation, through an interaction with history. If, if you read about history in a classroom setting, or you're listening to something on the TV, it's something you might remember, but to experience history, to be enveloped in history, that gives all of us a better understanding of what it must have been like. A better appreciation of what it must have been like to be an 18 year old scared out of your wits at 24,000 feet. World War II, over 68 years ago, these whippersnappers here were 18, around 18, 19 years old. World War II is the worst conflict in human history. Since all of us here have been on this little blue marble in space, it's the worst, most terrible, horrific conflict that all of us had to endure. It's estimated that over 60 to 90 million people died as a result of this conflict. All these things are so important to remember. It's so important to remember what it means to fight for your country and to fight for freedom. Now with all the stuff going on, we don't realize just how lucky we have it right now. During World War II, just in the Army Air Corps alone, over 88,000 young men lost their lives in the span of four years. Imagine the, the numbers, imagine the terrible suffering and loss of our sons during this battle. So again, the war was, was fought primarily over one thing, the freedom, the, the quality of being free. Men entered the service and fought to preserve the freedoms we all enjoy today. Freedom of religion, Freedom of certain beliefs. The ability to question and challenge our leaders. The ability to vote, to express ourselves without persecution. These are the things worth fighting for. Americans, when we entered World War II and turned the tide of impending oppression and suffering, men entered service and fought to preserve the freedoms that we all enjoy today. There was a, uh, a fellow you might know by the name of George Washington, and he said, the willingness to which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive veterans of earlier wars were treated and appreciated by our nation. Roosevelt said, speaking in reference to Italian uh, dictator, Mussolini and German dictator, Hitler, force is the only language they understand, like bullies. This is why I'm honored to be a part of this round table today. We'll start with Mr. Frank Curry, Medal of Honor recipient, uh, 30th Infantry, 
Mr. Sal Homer, B-24 veteran, uh, John McAuliffe, M Company, B-47 Infantry, and Mr. Bennett Black. So we'll start with uh, Mr. Frank Curry, and after, if we have enough time, we'll do a little uh, question and answers, if you have questions after the, uh, the talk. Uh, Mr. Frank Curry? They named the Pope after me, so I can say be seated. Hello, <laughs> Okay, and introduce myself quick. Uh, Frank Curry. I was with the 30th Infantry Division in World War II. Served in a European uh, European theater. Saw my first combat in uh, the Netherlands in September 1944. Went through the uh, to the uh, end of the war. Met the Russians up at Magdeburg in uh, May 1945. Up on the Elbe River, uh, Everybody asked me. Well, obviously, I, I do have a the Medal of Honor. A little background on that from World War II. At the end of World War II, there were approximately 250 medals of honor issued. About 60% of them were posthumous. So roughly about 40%, maybe 150 offhand number, actually survived to receive the medal. But what I estimate today of 150, there are still nine of us living in this country. And unfortunately, uh, 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 I hope it's one of ours. Uh, uh, as a little sidebar, uh, as uh, Mr. Collins said this morning on the reenact, this is an actual uh, reenactment of a battle outside of Aachen, Germany. A Aachen was the first German city that was liberated and was on the border between the Netherlands and Germany. And uh, they do a pretty good job because I think as, as I can be a, a judge, I actually participated in that battle. So it brings back a few thoughts. Okay, as, as far as the Medal of Honor, everybody, I, I, after I get done, done talking about it, they said, well, what did you do to get that medal? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about today. And, and I might add that that day in uh, December 9th was just one day of nine months of steady combat, and I, I don't I personally do not consider it such a big, big, big deal. So what I'm going to stress is what they left out of that, and I hope the people can appreciate it, because last year, here, one, one of the two men that they speak about uh, that were saved that day, the wounded, was here, well, he was here with me that, that day. And I think that's the only part of that whole action that I'm really proud of. Proud of. Uh, well, we were, uh, the, Ger the Germans uh, broke through on the 17th of December in uh, Luxembourg. Uh, my division was up in the Netherlands. We were preparing for across the Ruhr River and in, into Germany. And uh, overnight, almost, they, they uh, changed all the battle plans and they moved us from up at Mount Maastricht in the Netherlands down into Malmody, Belgium. Okay, so we, we were finally set up down there on the 20th of December, 1944. We were spread so thin that my squad 
of 12 men was broken up. They took six of us into Malmody to guard this very, very vital place. And I, to, to this day, I really have no idea where they took the other six guys. But we had a front that you could not believe for just 12 men to go home. The, the principal action was the south, the south of us at a uh, small uh, town called Stavelot that the Germans really needed bad, badly. And that's where the major action was to hold them. The Germans were unable to break through down to Stavelot. They had one last gasp. They had to go up to the north and take Malmody to get back on the Autobahn or they were done. That would be the end of the bulge. Unbeknownst to us, the, 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 uh, on the 20th of December, there was a, a paper mill located beside this bridge we look at. It had been converted into a large U.S. Army hospital. On the, on the 20th of uh, December, they evacuated that hospital. And I mean, they left everything behind. If I had the qualifications, I could have uh, done brain surgery. Their operating rooms, everything were intact. That, that evening, on the 20th of December, a, a large army patrol came through. And uh, I recall uh, my uh, company commander talking to them. And they said, look, we have looked, uh, uh, explored this whole area out in front of you. It's mountainous. They cannot operate armor in, the, in this area. have to put up with that in 1944. <laughs> they said they could not operate in, in that air area. So they said if you just leave a few men to guard that bridge, you might get a few German stragglers. And they can handle it. So they left six of us behind there to guard this very vital bridge. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> Army intelligence is an act of war. But believe it, because about four o'clock that morning, we hear this big rumble coming down the secondary road through the mountains out in front of us. And lo and behold, here come the Germans bumper to bumper with their armor. Now, unfortunately, our patrol didn't tell them they couldn't do that. So, to make the story short, uh, we engaged them. Uh, I'm going to gloss over that. When you read an ar army or military citation, you, you think, my God, people have told me, they were, you did all that in a half hour? And I say, no, that took an, uh, a period of 24 hours, but the army has to compress this so it can be put on one sheet of paper. <laughs> so, okay. so during the course of the day, I get credit. I, I took out four German tanks, some infantry, uh, uh, this anti-tank outfit was out in front of us. They left their half-track with us. Uh, but but in midday, things calmed down, and uh, I had the tra training. And what was it in, in this factory? When the Germans hit us real hard, we, we abandoned the bridge and went in this factory. It was all on one story with a lot of windows. And we ran from window to window, knocking the glass out and firing. So the Germans thought there were uh, quite a few of us down there. And they held back. And there was an empty spot in front of the factory like this where, where, where their infantry could not come across because they were subject to our fire. So during the afternoon, the Germans had pulled back. We were there. and. Uh, So, uh, what, what actually happened, uh, I went out. This anti-tank outfit went out in front with their big gun and, and without any infantry support. Well, they were knocked out of the action immediately by the Germans coming in. 
and the five of their people were pinned down uh, between a house and three German tanks. They could not get out on, uh, on ten of the fire from the tank. Uh, during the course of the afternoon, I went back to their half track. I found a couple cases of anti-tank grenades, which I used, and I managed to disable them three tanks and got the five guys back. And uh, one of them was very severely wounded. So while I covered them, uh, they had to set up a light machine gun, and I covered their fire. Them guys got out and they took their wounded guy with them. When they got back to my guys, they left him and they took off, which they were no use to us anyway and not being infantry. So here it comes, now here is the best part they left out that I am the proud of and I'm so proud of the guys who are with me. It's getting dark. Here we got six guys, the oldest one about 21 years old. We got two severely wounded. One is from my squad. And what are we going to do? We got to abandon them two fellows there? No way. In, in the uh, courtyard of this factory, they, uh, we found an abandoned jeep with two stretcher mounts uh, on it. Like if any of you ever seen MASH, you see when they run up the hill there, they get this stretcher mount, or this jeep with this stuff. So here we are, six young, young men. I was only 19, and I say the other, uh, the, uh, the other uh, five, there was only one, I think he's 21 years old. So here's how we were gonna do this, okay. So we, we got this jeep, Fortunately, it's got gas in it. Okay, I had been to OCS. They, they, most of the cells we get, okay, Curry, you're in charge. You do, what are we gonna do? Okay, who, who can drive a standard train? Shin, you? Okay, you're gonna drive the Jeep. Uh, you other uh, four, four, four guys are going to hold the stretchers. You had no, and uh, I, I had a Browning automatic rifle. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to sit on that rear wheel, ride shot, shot, and uh, if, we're, if we're stopped by a German road, roadblock, I'm going to hop off and engage them, and you guys get the hell out, out of there. Oh, okay. We went across that bridge, back towards our own lines. We're completely surrounded at that point. And we go down this autobahn, and uh, we were never challenged. So here we are, six young men in the wilderness of rural Belgium with two severely wounded men. What do we do? We just kept on going. To make a fact, we were finally challenged, but by, it was a roadblock by one of our fellow regiments. Now we got a problem. We're coming in from the German side. Yeah. So, there's a lot of banter back back and forth. They, they finally let us in. The first thing they did, of course, they took our weapons, they, they took our wounded, and uh, nobody would believe what we did. And uh, so, event, event, that was probably early in, in the morning, it's still, it's still dark, dark. By daylight, we had been gone, sent through echelon to echelon, Finally, somebody with some intelligence said, hey, let's check this out. They checked back with our regiment, send them back over to us. It got all straightened out. And uh, by the next evening, we were back down guarding that same bridge. <laughs> no. Okay, that's 21st. I'm, I'm going to short, shorten it. You know, I got to the chapter to tell me here. Three. Okay, myself, I, I went on uh, in, in uh, we, we, we moved out about six weeks, uh, about four weeks later than that. I picked up a Silver Star in, in Belgium with a, uh, against the Hermann Goring Paratroop Division. Uh, in, in, in March, we crossed the Rhine River and yeah, got tangled up with some German. I picked up a Bronze Star, went on. And uh, met the Russians up at Magdeburg in May of 1945. And from then on, the war is over. Thank you.
Co-pilot was the oldest at 22. Pilot was 21. We, uh, I, I got three short stories that I'll do fast for you. We left Maine to go to India. That's where we were going to be stationed at the 10th Air Force. And uh, we flew down to Bermuda, and from Bermuda we went to the Azores. And from Going from Bermuda to the Azores, it was only supposed to take about three hours. Uh, being a tail gunner, I was sitting in the waist. That's how we did to sit down and wait till we got to uh, our destination. And we, I'm looking at the watch and I'm saying, this seems to be awful long. It was about three and a half going on four hours. And all of a sudden, the pilot gets gone. He says, uh, I got, we got problems. He says, we're running out of gas, and what happened? Well, we did hit an electrical storm, and what we didn't know, it, it put out our radio, and our radio compass was hit by lightning. And the navigator was going by whatever, and he was sweating bullets, and he said, we should have been there an hour ago, and we haven't. So the pilot said, let's go down. We're going down below the clouds. Look, anyone sees land, holler. We went down, nothing. Went back up again. He says, he, he, trying to think what to do, whether to ditch the plane or jump out. <laughs> so uh, he said, get ready to ditch. So when they say that, we have to get everything and throw it out of the plane to make the plane lighter. So he pulled the guns and putting them down on, near the door to throw them out. And, he said, well, I'm going to try once more. Let's go back down and look again. We come down, and we, we didn't have to turn left or right. Right in front of us was the airport where we were supposed to land. And to my head was going, my mother's going to get this telegram. Your son was missing in action. But we're not in action. We're on our way overseas. But anyway, that was that story. The other story we were assigned a mission to go, there was a Japanese battleship in the uh, Indian Ocean. And there was three planes assigned to go out after it to drop some bombs on. Well, we got halfway there and they called us back and said that uh, a British destroyer was in the area and they were gonna tackle it, as so they called us back. Well, you never come back to the airport with a loaded uh, bombs on it, so we had to jetson the bombs in the Indian Ocean. And uh, so you bombardier jetson the bomb, and I'm sitting there waiting, you know. He calls and he says, Sal, go back and look in the bomb bay. He says, I think one of the bombs didn't fall. It doesn't show on the indicator. So I said, okay. He said, you can't go up there with a parachute with a very narrow eight-inch catwalk and uh, I went out there, and sure enough, there's two hangers on a bomb, and one of the hangers was caught. There was only one hanger holding the bomb, a 500-pound bomb. So I went out there, and uh, I, they toggle switch that you hit, and the bomb will drop. And I should have known better, but being 18 years old, I decided I was going to watch the bomb drop, and I'm holding with one hand like this. But when a 500-pound bomb drops off the plane, the plane goes up like this, fast. And I'm holding this thing, and the bomb drops, and I fell. And I reached over, here's the bomb bay doors. I fell and hit the bomb bay doors. I'm holding the doors with my hands and my two feet are on the eight-inch catwalk. And I'm looking down at the Indian Ocean, <laughs> no parachute. And, uh, and then I looked over, and there's the engineer. He came down to see if everything was all right. And I saw a holler, shut the door, shut the door. <laughs> he finally shut him, and I crawled up and got out. And the, the last one was, what was the last one? Outside the hangers, the boxes. 
uh, one of our missions was to Rangoon, and uh, the observation plane said they spotted a lot of cases on the dock of the piers there. They didn't know whether the Japanese had gasoline or food or whatever, there was ammunition. So they sent three planes out to strafe it. So that meant in briefing they said you're going to come in real low and strafe these boxes. Every time you shoot your gun, there's a gun camera that's taking pictures of what you're hitting at, at shooting at. And so we did, we came in real low, 500 feet, or uh, low, I guess, and there's those cases, and we shooting them up, you could see the, the bullets hitting them, and the cases splattering, like, so as soon as you land, the gun, the, the photographers come out and pull the camera, gun cameras out, and they go develop the, the, the film, and we go to debriefing. So we're in, there, we're in there debriefing and they're asking us, did you see any planes? We did see two Japanese planes on the ground, but they didn't come out. This was toward the end of the war, and they were being, uh, they didn't have gasoline evidently, so they didn't come up after us. Any guns, I said, yeah, rifle fire, and we were so low, they were shooting at us with rifle. So all of a sudden, the points that had to do a you know, comes open and here's this photographer coming in and he has this big square ball of cotton or whatever film. He said, wait till you see this. You guys won't believe what you were shooting at. He says, you were so low I could see some writing on the boxes. So I kept blowing it up and he blew it up to about three feet by two feet and he flipped it over. Patch blue ribbon. <laughs> Honest to God, the Japanese didn't like our beer, and evidently when they captured Rangoon, they had all these beer cases in the Quonset hut, and they put them all out on the pier, and it was left there, and we were shooting up. You could see the beer sprouting out from the pier. And that's, that's my story. Thank you. By the way, I was the youngest, the youngest one on the board at Teal Gunner, and the nose gunner was two months older than me. The pilot was only 21. <laughs> How's that? How about that? <laughs> Thank you. I want to thank uh, my friend there, Hunter, for holding these. The sessions, uh, reenacting the Battle of the Falls and other battles, gives an idea to the general public of the armamentarium and the various weapons we use, and also an insight into what it might be like undergoing uh, tank and all, uh, other weapons. But uh, years ago, when I was about 14, we used to go to the movies. We didn't have TV and that stuff. So you go in and pay your 10 cents and, and you got a major picture, a comic, and you come into an attraction. And you also got the movie tone news. We didn't have worldwide photographers going around taking pictures. But we did have the newsreels come from various countries. And I remember one coming from Germany the heart of Germany, and it showed at the Nuremberg Stadium, something like the Rose Bowl, you can imagine how big it was, and all these German soldiers with their standards and bearers, and they're all shouting, Heil Hitler! And it reverberated around the whole stadium. They had all kinds of banners and standards, and it really got me scared. Here I am, a 14-year-old kid, and then when you see an army like that, you say, this isn't the end, something's going to happen. Well, anyway, I went into high school, and the Battle of Britain was going on. And I used to read the Reader's Digest, these stories of these great pilots and their hurricanes and spitfires warding off the Germans coming across the bomb their towns 
People used to go into the underground in London and come out in the morning and the whole city would be burning. Well, they had to do something about that. They were very brave people. And they had to do something to preserve their progeny. They sent the young children way up into Scotland to get out of harm's way. During the war, many people don't know that they also many of, sent many of these children to cities in the United States, out in the Midwest, maybe right here in New England, where they went to school, they learned the American ways. And five or six years after the war, getting to know each other, many of them married. Some of them went back to England with an American husband or what. So that happened during the war. So that was high school. And the, uh, on the British Isles, you had these aerial gunners shooting down the Germans as they were coming over. And a couple of years after that, my friend Joe Landry here was one of those fellows with that ACAC gun shooting down British planes, uh, German planes. Well, anyway, it came time, I graduated from high school and I got into Holy Cross College as a freshman. Two months later, Pearl Harbor came. Everybody's joining up in the service. They're all going down to sign up. And I did it because I was uh, concentrating on having a medical career and I had a dispensation because the country needed doctors and linguists, engineers, and they let those boys stay in college. At the same time, the government had a, what they call an Army Student Training Program. About 6,000 young men who passed examinations, they had very high IQs, and they were sent off to various colleges around the country. They were going to become engineers, linguists, because they anticipated interrelations with the Russian and Japanese after the war, and uh, doctors. Well, that was around the summertime of 43. Come February of 1944, the Army scrapped the whole program and put these boys in the infantry. Instead of carrying slide rules and textbooks, they were carrying M1 rifles and they were being sent overseas to Europe to fight the war. It was the most educated army we ever had with all those young boys taken out of college and going to the infantry. At the same time I graduated in three years, I lost my dispensation and I was sent into the army. We trained down at Fort Wheeler, Camp Wheeler, Georgia. I trained in heavy weapons, machine gun and mortar. We graduated from that January 1st, we were sent overseas. Now at that time you had the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth, the two biggest ships afloat, they were British ships, carrying troops across to the front. Each ship had about 18,000 troops, you can imagine how condensed it was, boys getting seasick, it was a real horror. But they went up to Scotland where they unloaded and then they went across the channel, put in boxcars in the middle of winter for three days and three nights, dark, no food, a little food, very, very little conveniences, day and night. And they ended up in forts and places up on the front line where they were sent out to the various divisions to replace the men who had been killed or wounded, replace the divisions. Well, I got up there and there's, everything's alphabetic in the army, you know, your, your bed assignment, whatever. There you go, it's A, B, C's down the line. So we got up there and we were sent out to the 87th Division. Finally, we broke down, I was sent out to M Company, 347th Regiment. We were sitting in a barn with the captain, which was the headquarters, and he interviewed eight of us coming in as new men. This man was a college graduate, 
He called him Big Jake. He played football for the University of Georgia. And he was a very uh, gung-ho captain. Well, he interviewed all of us, and he said, you're in the mortars, you're in the machine gun. Or you me, you're in the mortars. Then the next day, they take you out into the woods where you meet your staff sergeant. Sergeant Kelly was there. The other sergeant said, take two men. He took me and another fellow. The other fellow's name was Manley, the six footer. So he said, I'll take those two. And that's when I got into the hole in the ground. That night, in two feet of snow, it was my turn to do guard duty. You're out in the woods, nobody around. You're shivering cold. You're out there standing all alone in the pitch of night. And you know, what the hell am I doing out here? And that's when the feeling set in. Be careful, look around. There might be some Germans around with patrol dogs. And you're thinking what you've been doing back home, maybe going to a football game with your buddies and your young friends. And it really hits you. That's what, what the heck? What am I doing? Well, that's where things happen. I was in the Battle of Falls. I didn't see the worst of it. I came in a little later. I was a replacement. And there's been stories going on. The placements come up. There's staff sergeants, there's platoon sergeants, the two squad leaders don't even know their names yet. And they've been killed the day before out of the woods someplace. So uh, the Battle of the Bulge happened. But before the Battle of the Bulge, in uh, November, there was the Battle of the Hurtgen Forest. But that wasn't bad. It was just as bad and intense as the Bulge. They sent in four divisions to gain maybe a thousand yards from here to the town of Stowe. Back and forth, back and forth. I think they tried to use that to preserve the, the dams. There were certain dams out there that didn't want them destroyed so it wouldn't flood the area. But it gained nothing. All it was like the, the trenches of World War I. They were sending men into slaughter. So that was over, and they sent troops from there down into the bulge. The 28th Division really got mauled in the Hurtgen Forest. They were the ones that, from Pennsylvania, the Keystone State, their shoulder patch was like a, a red keystone. And the Germans called them the bloody buckets. You might, you can imagine. The 28th Division was sent down on the front line facing the Germans. There were only four divisions and the fence about 25 miles apart. That's not according to military standards when you're up in a fight, front fight. What did the Germans do? They came pouring through the 28th Division, which was already mauled. They really got beat up. At the defense of Bastogne, they found more men from that division in the perimeter than any other outfit. Well, the Battle of Bastogne came after Colonel Piper. He led the second German infantry division into the bulge. He was the leader. He had a couple of hundred tanks, 20 Tiger tanks. He put it at the end of the line because they were too big. They blocked the roads. If anything got hit, they couldn't get through. So he stuck them at the end of the line. Colonel Piper, was supposed to lead the assault to reach the Meuse River 50 miles away. But he ran into a lot of difficulty, of course. His troops went up to Malmody, where the, Mal the Malmody massacre happened. Some 87 troops taken out in the field, disarmed, and mowed down by machine gun fire. Maybe 86 were killed, some escaped. The Piper went on forward. He was running out of gasoline. He had tanks and troops, and he was looking for gas. He couldn't find it. All the gas was up in a town in Frank on shore. Millions of gallons. 
which the Americans took away, they evacuated it. So he considered the whole thing fruitless. So they get out of their tanks and walk back to Germany, defeated. But then the next move was to get into the town of Bastogne because it had several good roads going westward which they thought they could use. Well, they ran into difficulty there because of many good troops. For instance, the 7th Army Division, the 10th Army Division, they held out very well until members of the 101st Airborne, maybe second, came into the picture. I think they were given more credit than they deserved because of the other Army Division that held off enabling them to come. Otherwise, they never would have been able to get there. So the battle went on, and uh, how big was the battle of, uh, of Baston? It took place in Belgium and Luxembourg. If you look at the map of Massachusetts, you'll see Boston, the North Shore up around here. Draw a line down the East Coast to Cape Cod Canal. Go west toward Worcester, or maybe the Brookfield. You have a triangle. That's the area of the Battle of Bulge. About 65 miles in, maybe 50 or 60, that one. That was their penetration that was made until more troops came and pushed them back. The battle lasted 42 days. There were 81,000 American casualties, killed and wounded. Averages out to about 500 killed a day. So we were down, my, my division fought on the outside of Bastogne, about eight miles from the west of it. And then we came down into Luxembourg, where we fought a few battles. We went back into Belgium and went into the German territory. That was around February 3rd or 4th. It was the beginning of what they call the Siegfried Line. Siegfried Line extended going maybe 400 miles or more along the coast of Germany. They had underground dwellings where they kept their ammunition, sleeping quarters, the trains come in to supply them. It was very heavily protected. I remember we were moving in there. As I said, I was in the mortars. I carried the rounds for the mortar. That weighed about 42 pounds, six of them. I carried them over my shoulder, I had my weapon, my pack, had all the heavy equipment and galoshes. The snow was that deep. And I come up to the end of the woods, and there was a lieutenant there sending the men out at 25 yard intervals. And when he came up to me, he said, that's too much, meaning I was carrying too much. I only really weighed 150 pounds. These six footers are carrying pistols. And all those little guys are carrying all kinds of stuff. So he sent us out, and we get out in the middle of that terrain. The woods are maybe 500 yards apart. Clumps of wood, that's the forest. Then we started taking shelling. You fall down on your face and you're hoping one of the shrapnel doesn't hit those six rounds on the back. So you lay there in the snow, you don't want to get up. Pretty soon the sergeant comes by, just keep going back, move up, move up. So you move up into the next woods, and you're taking more shelling. And you're hiding under trees and logs. And come out of there, the kid next to me is holding his knee, it was all blown up. I didn't have to get hit. Well, that was, the Siegfried Line, that night we slept in a bunker. The German bunker was a sleeping bunker. It didn't have any uh, other provisions, guns or weapons. 
but it gave you time to take your shoes off. The cold down there, but to give you a little respite from being out in the open. You might get a good night's sleep because you were in protection. Well, that was the end of the balls and, and going into the Siegfried line. The Siegfried line was another battle. You had the Battle of the Ardennes, and you had the Battle of the, the, the Siegfried line. Getting back through that, through the winter and spring, we approached the Rhine River. The Rhine River may have been two or three hundred yards wide, but in the winter time it was very fast flowing because it took all the snow from the towns and the water was elevated. It was very fast flowing. So we had to get down to the Rhine. I think our division spent three days there. My regiment alone took 77 men killed, many more wounded. The other regiments did the same. I got down to the Rhine River uh, with my uh, squad, and we were taken with the head 20 millimeter rounds from across and traces. The bullets were going about as high as the ceiling over us. All of a sudden, I saw a P-51 come by, and he strafed the gunner and took him out. But from then on, that became my most favorite plane. But uh, as we were in the house that day doing nothing, other troops were making a crossing. They were crossing in boats, a little longer than this table, no wider. Some of them were paddling. Some of them had little motors on the back, and some of them were like rubber rafts. And I have a friend back home who was in my company. He was in one of those rubber boats. He turned around, the boat and back were no longer there. They were getting hit and floating down the river, boys swimming in the river. They got pretty bad. About midnight, we were told to move out and go down the river. We didn't know much would happen before. So we came to a bunch of boats, bigger than this. They were the landing barges. So we got in those, and uh, I said to myself, if, if we get hit, I'm taking my boots off now, and I'm lacing them. I'm going in the river, because most of us folks from Massachusetts are good swimmers. We go out to the ocean and swim. I was a good swimmer, so I was going to be prepared to jump out. But nothing happened. We made the other shore. It took us all night to get back down the river where the gunner was killed. But about five years ago, I got a call from Florida. This man called me up. He said, were you in the town of Bopard? I said, yeah. In the 87th Division? I said, yeah. He said, how did you cross the river? He said, well, it was in one of those landing barges. He said, those were my boats. He was a Navy lieutenant. He had six boats at the Normandy landing, and he lost one. But when it came time to cross the river, all these barges were put on flatbeds and sent up 10 hours to get to the Rhine to enable the men to cross over. This lieutenant on the phone told me he took over 5,000 troops, including the men in my division and the other one, 10 miles up the river. But he said, you know what the Navy did? They gave us sleeping bags to sleep outside. Can you imagine? He said, I didn't use those. We went up and knocked on doors to get in. He knocked on one door, and this German lady wouldn't let him in. And he said to her in Jewish, this that I'm Juden, I am a Jew. So she promptly opened the door and let him in. No meaning the Holocaust, no. So he was pretty excited to talk to someone he took across the Rhine River. About 20 miles north of us where we crossed was called Operation Varsity. It was a combined action by the British and American Airborne. 
Uh, one of the biggest, I met a fellow who was in the 17th Airborne. They fought with us up in the Bulge. It was the biggest operation since Nor the Normandy invasion. But people don't know, 17th Airborne took more casualties than the 82nd Airborne in the Normandy invasion. But you don't hear about that, because that's an after effect. It was only five weeks before the war was over. If you go on the internet and look at Operation Varsity, you'll find out the immense operation that was. It practically sealed the war right there. Well, I don't have many, much more to say. Uh, I will say we were supposed to move out on a task force, our unit, uh, May 2nd or 3rd, but they called it off because the war was over. And uh, the 11th Panzer Army surrendered to our division. And the men went out down the line taking all their weapons and got uh, daggers and cameras and pistols. We got a whole bunch of those. And my friend was born in Italy. He came over to the States in 1935. His father didn't want him to go to school under Mussolini. So he brought him to Massachusetts. And he was working as a welder down at the Four River Shipyard building battleships. They no longer needed battleships, they needed infantrymen. So that's how we met up. But uh, he told me he went up to a German officer with the boots on, the high hat and all. He had a beautiful long dagger, a dress dagger. <laughs> and he says, give me that dagger. He took it from me. The German complained, that's not government issue. I paid for that with my own money. The German gave me his address and his name. He said, well, sometime you can send it back to me. My friend lived in Newtonville. He still has a note and a dagger in the basement of his home. So a lot of things like that happened. He said, come on, John, let's go down to the pond. There was a little pond about half the size of this room. So we went in for a swim. It was a long spring day. The Germans were doing the same thing on the other side of the pond, washing up, singing, Lily Molly, Mike Mullen, the greatest song ever came out of the war. But there the war was over, everybody was happy. One day you were enemies, the next day you're friends, I guess. Well, that night we gathered around the campfire, a few of us, and we were able to light fires. Somebody passed around a bottle of cognac. We each had a sleep, a, a swig of it, and we went in our beds to sleep. Over in New York City, you had seven million people celebrating. Over at the Arc de Triomphe, you had another million celebrating. And in Piccadilly Square, you had millions more celebrating. And we were going to just went in a tent, lay down, and went to sleep.
We said, gee, that is the war of Putin. Sad. So anyways, we we passed the exam somehow. And uh, we say, sure enough, we entered the war. And uh, right off, uh, they, we were in ROTC, and they started saying, you're going to stay in the ROTC, you'll get four years of college, and then they'll pay you. But my father was, knew something about World War I, and he said, that's not necessarily true. So anyway, we, um, I, uh, in a few days, a recruiting officer came around and showed a picture of the Air Force. And she, you know, I said, that sounds pretty good to me. I think I'll join. And everybody says, you're foolish. We'll stay in the ROTC. You'll see it right here. Well, then I came home and I got a, I, well, anyway, it, Called. I, I went to the recruiter and I said, I'm interested in joining. He said, well, good. Just sign up this paper and you'll be in the service. And sure enough, he gave me a card saying that I was in the United States Army. And nothing about the Air Force, but he said, go home and wait and they'll give you a call. And sure enough, in a short time, they called up and they said, go into Boston, take another exam, and you'll be in the Air Force. And about 2,000 went in, and, and the exam was quite difficult, but somehow I passed it. And uh, they said, well, go home again, and we'll give you a call. I went, well, pretty soon they called up, and, and uh, I went into pilot training. And, First day there, we were out in Tennessee. Uh, we went out to a, a stem in Lake South Hill, I guess, and uh, we had a parachute on. We walked out to it, and this fellow said, he said, you ever been up in a, this airplane before? And I said, I've never even seen one. So he said, well, get in, and I'll show you what I will do. Well, he did. He showed us how to spin, how to climb, everything that Stephen would do. And he was a crop duster, so it, he'd been flying with me. So anyways, I got out and I said, well, I don't know if I'm going to like this or not, but I stayed through when I graduated from primary flight school. And uh, the next day, Two officers came up and he said, you, you'd make a good pilot, but we don't need fellows that can land a transport and a pay for you. We're going to send you to Nashville, Tennessee and reclassify you. And so I went down. Next thing I know, I was off to Vomit Air School. And uh, I spent good time there and learned how to look for the Martin Martin bomb site and hit a target. And sometimes you could actually hit the ground and the target both. But anyways, we graduated, went to Marshfield, and I was the second lieutenant. And I got this jacket issued me and these similar shirts and uh, Next thing I knew, we were, uh, we, we were sent home and they said, uh, go to West Silver Field and wait for assignment. And well, right off we knew, being a West Silver, we were going to Germany. And well, a few days, I got another letter saying, forget West Silver, uh, where you're going. Get out to Van, uh, Van Nuys, California, as quick as possible for a reassignment. And I went to Matchfield and, and met some other men, ten, nine other men, and we formed a crew and we uh, started learning how to ride around the B 24 and drop simulated bombs. 
And that's, that's very pretty, right? And the next thing I knew, we we got a notice that we were going to fly to uh, Hawaii. Well, right off we said, we're not going to Germany, we're going to Hawaii. And we flew to Hawaii, and then we they spent one night and we went to Australia. And then they took our plane. We had a brand new plane made by Ford in the San Diego, California. And uh, so we flew up to uh, South uh, Borneo. And uh, we, uh, we did a little more training. And uh, we uh, you know, got rid of Rapa in New Guinea. And uh, lo and behold, the plane we flew from California was there. And what they had done is put a, a bomb turret on the bottom of a V-24. They hadn't done that before because everything was in formation flight. And uh, the Japanese had found a way with a zero. They could come straight up underneath of us. And put, and, uh, so they put the turret there and said, now wait a little. What, what, hold the fire till I get near you, and you'll do well. And we did. So anyway, we had a B-24 with a, 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 re, a new type bomb site, not in bomb site, a belly turret, and uh, we were off flying again. And uh, first, first, the second mission we flew, there was a after listening to these fellows, I was glad I was in the Air Force, not out in the ground. But we went, we flew down to, further down in Borneo, to an oil refinery, the Japanese, the, the Dutch had built it, and the, the Japanese had taken it over. And uh, it was 18 hours round trip from where we were stationed in. It was, it was scary because the Japanese had a hundred fighter planes that hadn't seen action, and all they did was train them. They really devastated our range quite a little. And, uh, but we got back, luckily. And uh, we didn't know who our boss was, but in short order, we learned it was MacArthur and Kenny and a few other big agendas. So uh, we uh, they revised the method of flying down to Valica Patton, which was the oil refinery. And uh, they uh, got a, somehow get the P-41s, 50 ones, rigged so they could fly down and uh, they flew down up and above us. And just as we got to the refinery, the Japanese flew out and closed and 50 P-51s with us went after them. And by the time they finished, there was about four Japanese planes left. So we were well on our way to succeed. And uh, we kept flying. And uh, I've heard that noise before. But anyway, somebody said, to you, now that you're a bombardier, not only do you hit the ground, you hit the target. And so uh, he said, from now on, you'll be a lead bombardier. So I flew the next 28 missions in the South Pacific and all around Borneo and Central. And uh, being the lead bombardier, I was out front. We'd fly over a Japanese 
uh, warship or land tag airport. And uh, they couldn't figure how high up we were. So they, they'd fire colored rockets. And when they get me on a plane, they'd say, well, oh, he's at 9,000 feet. So they'd, they never could get the first plane. So we were very lucky. We flew 28 missions and got very few holes in this one. Other planes didn't make it. So anyways, uh, we got overseas early and finished our missions. I came back home to Broughton, Mass, just in time to be in the Memorial Day Parade. And I wore this jacket and badge and stuff. And uh, I've been happy to be back in Broughton for, and not fighting the Battle of the Bows and not fighting my police self and work. But I, I that's, that's my story. <laughs>